competitive person that's also humble in that competitiveness. And so years ago when I first met Matt, um, we, we had to become friends because our wives have been best friends since first grade. So, but we were sitting down at Applebee's having dinner one, one evening and, and Matt will eat anywhere where there's food. So we were at Applebee's and the chef came out of the kitchen with a dinner plate um, for Matt to, to uh, autograph. And, um, and Matt was humbled that the guy came and, and appreciative of giving his autograph, which I've seen a lot of folks not so humble. Um, so in that, it, I saw something in him that he also really um, cherishes relationships that he, that he forms. It's not hardly anybody that he doesn't want to know who you are and then later even how can I help you? So for those reasons, for his, his view on and his study of life and the competitiveness and the humbleness in his heart, um, that's why um, I asked him to be here this morning. So I'm grateful for that he's here and I'm grateful for his friendship, Matt Darty. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm a little disappointed Rick stopped. I thought he was going to continue on with some more superlatives, but uh, I'll take what I can get from him. Uh, I'm going to remind him of everything he just said. That's why I was filming on the ride home, because he generally doesn't say nice things to my face. Um, it is fortunate that, uh, you know, usually um, as a husband, your wife meets somebody that they like in a community, and then it's your job to act like you like that person's husband. Um, and with, Ke can you hear me in the back okay? Uh, with Kelly and Nancy being such good friends and they're in the back <laughs> since first grade, Rick and I really didn't have much of a choice. And fortunately, we do enjoy each other's company and we'll get together even without our wives. So uh, it, it is kind of a match made in heaven. Um, Rick touched on me filming and watching film. And that's why I have that film right there, uh, because I want to get better. Uh, I want to get better every day. I don't want to make the same mistake twice. Uh, and that's something as a coach uh, that we, was one of our mottos, get better today win your next game, and then win the championship. And so it's a process. And you hear that with coaches all the time, from a Bill Belichick to a Nick Saban in Alabama. Um, and that carries over to, I think, any organization, uh, if you want to be successful. And again, if you want to be successful. Um, you all run successful eye care practices, and you all want to get better. Um, you know, even Chris, is Chris still here? Yeah, Chris, who has five practices, is that right? Four, five, three? Um, and he still wants to get better. I loved how he talked last night about how excited he is about what's next. You know, what's the wow? What, what is the cutting edge where he could bring it to his organization and then share it with his clients to make it a better experience for his um, clientele and his staff? Um, you've got into this profession probably because at a young age you like science. Uh, you were enamored with your biology class, your chemistry class. I was more of a math guy. Um, I'm a little analytical, I'm a little more right-brained. Probably you, a lot of people in here are right-brained. Um, and then you say, okay, well, I want to open up a practice. Well, your skill set flips. It goes from the technical ability you have and I care to the people skills, the soft skills, which you probably haven't been trained for. When you go to optometry school, have you ever been taught leadership? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. You ever learn about emotional intelligence in optometry school? I didn't think so, okay? I didn't either. And I think it's one of the most important skill to have, and yet it's the least taught. 
My uh, story, Rick told you I grew up on Long Island. Anybody from Long Island here? No, wait, 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 wait. Penny is from, Penny is from New York. Poughkeepsie. Damn, I'm sorry, <laughs> cut that. Anybody else from New York or Long Island? No, good, okay, there's enough of us down here. Um, I grew up, I went to play basketball at the University of North Carolina. I dreamed of playing college basketball. I dreamed of being an NBA player. Um, I was fortunate to be blessed with great parents and a dad who had an athletic background and was a minor league baseball player, played a lot through the South in the minor leagues and um, just exposed me to different sports. I gravitated to basketball because I, I loved it. You could get better every day without anybody else's help. You know, or baseball or football, you needed somebody else to work with. With basketball, I could go to the park and play all day working on my game, knowing that if I worked harder than somebody else, when we met, I would have the advantage. I read that in a Bill Bradley book. Now, some of you may not know who Bill Bradley is, but he was a great player at the, uh, at, with the Knicks, a great player at Princeton, Oxford, uh, uh, Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. And, um, you know, you're impacted by the people you meet, and I think that's why you're here, and the books you read. And I like to read books on successful people. I like to read books on leadership. Um, I drive a lot, so I get a lot of audio books and read about teamwork and, and how to get better. And uh, because uh, Roy Williams, who uh, I worked for for seven years, who's the head coach at North Carolina, he had a saying that you might be on the right track, but if you're standing still, you're gonna get run over. And obviously a lot of you are on the right track, but maybe you're standing still. Maybe you're comfortable. Maybe you, know, you feel good about where you're at and you can let your guard down a little bit. I don't get that sense from, again, Chris, I'm sorry, but you know, you've been at it how, how many years now? 46 years, and you're still trying to get better. I mean, how exciting is that? And that's gonna permeate through his organization. So I, I go, um, I have a good career. I get cut by the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, Rick was kind to say I got drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, but he didn't say it was in the sixth round. Now they only have two rounds because generally nobody past the second round makes it. Um, and so I got cut. By the way, back then the Cleveland Cavaliers were so bad they were called the Cleveland Cadavers. So not only was I drafted in the sixth round, but I got cut by the worst team in basketball. And as a um, person who identified with being a basketball player since fourth grade, that was devastating. Uh, it was almost like you're a longtime girlfriend breaking up with you and you saying, you know what, I don't need you anymore. And so I turned away from basketball and went to Wall Street and thought I was gonna find my self-worth making money. Now, I had a hard time when they'd ask you your goal on Wall Street, what's your goal? Well, you know what that means is, you know, financial goal. And I remember trying to say a number that wasn't comfortable with my Irish Catholic upbringing on Long Island. So. I moved, I quit my job, moved to Charlotte thinking that I was gonna get in the real estate business because in 1989, I thought that Charlotte would be the next Atlanta. And I think I was right, but I didn't get in the real estate business. Um, I started coaching uh, a youth basketball team. I really enjoyed it. And I said to myself, I have as much experience as people coaching in college, why don't I coach? So I was doing the radio at Davidson College. I was coaching this youth team. And then the, the, my high school coach, Bob McKillop, got the job at Davidson College. So I joined his staff and I was there three years. I loved it. I never worked harder for less pay in my life, but I loved what I was doing. And then I met Kelly. Um, she started She started hitting on me at this function <laughs> called Live After Five. I mean, that's the truth. Um, in Charlotte, and I couldn't beat her off with a stick. She seemed like a nice girl. So we started talking and, you know, one thing led to another. So anyway, that's true, right, Kelly? Yeah, Nancy was with, with her. 
Yeah, of course. Of course she was. And so uh, a year later, we were married. And then uh, two years later, or one year later, I was the head uh, assistant coach at Kansas. Was there for seven years under Roy Williams. Uh, went to a Final Four. Um, and then I became the head coach at Notre Dame. And so I go from being an assistant coach to a head coach at Notre Dame. It's a big jump. And then I go a year later, Bill Guthridge retires at North Carolina, my alma mater. Roy Williams turns the job down and Dean Smith offers it to me. And I'm the head coach at North Carolina. And you talk about skill sets flipping. I equate it to, okay, I go from being the sales clerk at an Ace Hardware to being the owner or manager of the Ace Hardware when I'm the coach at Notre Dame. And then all of a sudden, a year later, I'm the CEO. I take Jack Welch's place at, at GE. I'm the CEO of GE. Good luck with that. And oh, by the way, Jack still has his office in the building. Uh, coach Smith and Coach Guthridge still had offices in my building, uh, in my building, Coach Smith's building. It's the Dean Smith Center. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a grinder. If you tell me to do these 10 things and have it done by Friday, I will do it by Friday. I expect other people to be grinders too. I would walk from my car to my office and grind. And I would expect everybody else to grind. I became a direct report or I had people directly reporting to me about 50 people from four secretaries to 15 players to trainers to strength coaches to academics and all that stuff. But I also had to answer manage up. I had to manage to Coach Smith, Coach Guthridge, my athletic director, the president, the chancellor. I had to manage sideways to the other coaches in the organization, the other coaches in the league. That's a new skill set that even though I watched Roy Williams for seven years, you're not going through it. You're not experiencing it. There was no, there was no study guide. And after three years, I was forced to resign because things weren't going well. Uh, there was dissension in the organization. There was dissension in, in, with the uh, former players. Um, and I was forced to resign in an ugly uh, dismissal. Uh, it wasn't pleasant on me. It wasn't pleasant on my wife. Fortunately, our children were very young. Um, the hardest part was that was my alma mater. The hardest part was I gave up a great job at Notre Dame where they offered me a 10-year contract for a lot of money to stay. But I wanted to come back to North Carolina because I felt that, hey, Dean Smith and Michael Jordan both asked me to come back. Hard to turn that down. So, like I do as a coach, when you win or lose a game, you watch film. And where can I get better? A good friend of mine, John Black, who uh, ran an investment company in <clears throat> Charlotte, suggested I go meet with a, a lady named Carol Weber at the Darden School at UVA. He met with her when he went through a similar or, uh, situation with his investment company. The only difference is mine's in the news on ESPN every day for people to see and feel like your gut is getting exposed and ripped open to the world. So I met with Carol Weber. A half a day, it cost me $2,500. Might be a good business to get into. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she, had me take the Myers-Briggs test. Anybody here take the Myers-Briggs test? Okay. Um, or similar discs, you know, there's a lot of different personality typing uh, tests out there. And I had taken the Myers-Briggs test before and the results came up the same. I was an ENTJ. 
Uh, you, you're supposed to give me a standing ovation when I say that. No. So I'm like, okay, ENTJ, yeah. She said, only 8% of the population are ENTJs. And I walked in there uh, like a beaten dog, like this. And then she says, she said, Carol said, only 8% of the population are ENTJs. I started to kind of stand up tall in my chair and basically saying, you know what? I, I am a badass, aren't I? You know, like Carolina made a huge mistake getting rid of this eight percenter. Like I'm elite. And she's like, she knew what was going through my mind. She just shook her head. She's like, Matt, that means 92% of the population don't think like you think. And I'm like, oh my God. So I'm the grinder who goes from my car to my desk and grinds. Maybe all my secretaries aren't like that. They might be whatever the other 15 quadrants are in the Myers-Briggs test. So they don't think like I think. Maybe my assistants don't think like my, I think. And darn sure that my 15 basketball players don't think like I think. So. I went and took a class under her and her husband at Darden. And then I took another, I'm one that like, if you tell me, Matt, you need to work on your left hand, I'm gonna be working on my left hand every day, like eating with my left hand, cutting food with my left hand, drawing with my left hand, dribbling with my left hand, that I kind of overdo it. So I went to the Darden school I met with the Carol, Carol Weber, went to Darden School, went to uh, Wharton to take, these are just executive courses, week-long courses. You live on, you go to the dorm, you're with other people going through similar situations, and you're learning. I ended up meeting a lady named Fran Johnston, who runs the Leadership Institute in Philadelphia, and she's teaching a class about emotional intelligence. And this was in 2003. 2003, I had no idea what emotional intelligence was. Um, so I'm sitting in the class and we're going through this book and she's talking and I'm like, oh my gosh, if I would have taken this class before I became a head coach, I might still be the head coach at North Carolina because it's teaching me all the soft skills that a grinder doesn't have. A grinder doesn't go by the, the secretaries and say, good morning, how are you doing? How was your night last night? How's Johnny doing? Did he do well in his baseball game last night? How's your husband? I heard he had a little surgery on his elbow. Is he doing? That stuff matters. Now, it doesn't matter too much to me because I'm an ENTJ. I carry that flag, but it might matter to Penny, who might be someone else, another contract, uh, quadrant. It might matter to Chris. It might matter to Laura. It might, because you have a team. It's not just you now. And that's where the skill set flips, where at the bottom, it was the technical ability. I could scout and I could recruit. Um, I could do some drills. But as you go up this success pyramid, all of a sudden that skill set flips. It's not, Jack Welch doesn't know how to make a widget at GE. Jack Welch knows how to lead thousands of people you go from you know i care studying science to all of a sudden you have a team of five to 45. imagine chris probably has about 45 and some of the others in here have teams of five that's where i think team sports are a huge benefit growing up to deal with team to deal with leadership to deal with communication, to deal with stress, to deal with failure, and come together as one. Um, and that's, that's what you need. Because if you have five individuals acting as individuals, you're not gonna be as efficient as you need to if you have five people working as one. My daughter rose at the University of North Carolina. I didn't know anything about rowing. A great book, and I, I have a list of books. To, I think you got a handout. Um, at the end, there's a list of books 
uh, that I've liked to read and, and I would use as a reference. One of them is Boys in the Boat. And it's uh, anybody here read Boys in the Boat? Okay, it's a great book. And it taught me a lot about rowing, but it taught me about work ethic and teamwork. And, you know, in basketball, we got to work together. But in rowing, if you're like a half a second off or a half an inch where your blade's not in the water when somebody else's blade is, you lose time. And so my daughter is, is a rower. I'm very proud of her. My son plays lacrosse, and we've encouraged our kids at young ages to play sports, and I think there's a lot of lessons. Um, the other thing I did that I suggest, anybody here do a 360-degree survey with your team? Raise your hand. Is that uh, Esselor ask you to do that? Is that part of it, or do you do that independently? Yeah. Um, was some of that that you got back in black and white kind of like, oh my God, really? Like, right in the face. Hit you right in the face. Because people don't like to give you bad news. But as a leader, when you go out to lunch and you have the, the, the team behind, you know what they're doing? They're talking about you. That's the reality. Coach Williams, I remember when he said it, we, we were in the locker room, and uh, coach's locker room, and he walked in to the player's locker room, and there was a player standing up there complaining about Coach Williams. And Coach Williams walked in behind, and the player didn't know it. And the player kept going on and on and on and on. And he looked, all the other players saw Coach Williams, and they were like this. And the player finally realized, oh, my God, turned around, it's Coach Williams. Coach Williams was really cool. He said, hey, that's okay. What do you think we're doing in our locker room? We're talking about you guys. That's the truth. So you want to you wanna know. And I think it's your job as a leader to mine for the truth. Mine for that truth. Listen to what's not being said. Because there's a lot that's not being said to your face. And a lot of it's not good. And if you heard it, you might get really upset. And that leads me to another. You, any, if you people aren't, if you all are not on Twitter, I suggest you get on Twitter and follow people that you can learn from. Again, uh, I met with this Fran Johnston who became my executive coach. And she said to me, paid me a huge compliment. She says, you know what you are, you're a lifelong learner. And I'm like, wow. I never heard that term, but that's pretty cool. And I imagine Chris is from what I've heard just a little bit of his talk last night. You all should be. How can you become a better parent, a better friend, a better Christian, a better leader? And in this book, Primal Leadership, The Art of Emotional Intelligence, which is listed, the most exciting thing I've ever read one of the most exciting things I've ever read, leadership is a learned behavior. Because most of us think that you're born as a good leader and you can't improve on that skill set. I promise you, you can. You can. There are some fundamental things that you can do to train your mind, even though if you're not wired that way, if you're not a feely, touchy person, that's the emotional side, you're, you're more right brain like me, you can improve your emotional intelligence. And if you discount that, I don't think you'll maximize the talent you have in your office and therefore the revenue. Ultimately, you want to have the best practice possible and drive the most revenue. So I also did the 360 degree survey. Again, if you ask me to work on my left hand, I'm gonna dribble with my left hand all day and night. I'm gonna eat with my left hand. So I didn't do one 360 degree survey. I did two, probably overkill. But when I read in black and white, it was anonymous feedback about some of the things people didn't like about me and my leadership. It was a punch in the face. But you know what? I'd rather hear that than not hear it. Because you know what? Again, when you leave the office, they're gonna be talking behind your back. And you want them to be saying good things. 
More importantly, you want them to be feeling good things. It's not what you say that people will remember. Okay, when I leave here, one of the reasons I gave you notes, so you wouldn't have to write down everything or if you're zoning out because we all have a little ADHD. It's not so much what I'm gonna say, it's gonna be how you feel. How did I make you feel today? You as a leader will walk in your office, how do you make your team feel? Communication is 50% body language, 35% tone, and 15% content. Dr. Jerry Bell runs a leadership institute in Chapel Hill. When I was coaching, he'd meet with me once a month. And at first, Bill Guthridge suggested I do it, and I'm like, I don't have an hour. You know, I don't have It was the best investment of time I've ever had because I always learned something that I could immediately apply to my team. A lot of what I'm talking to you about now has come from him. The leadership pyramid, the success pyramid, the communication, 50% of communication is body language, no doubt. That's why text messaging can get you in trouble, emails can get you in trouble, because there's no body language. And there's not much tone, unless you go exclamation point, exclamation point, or emoji, 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 which sometimes isn't the most professional thing in the world. That's why good old face-to-face -face communication is a darn good thing. And if you study, like the book Steve Jobs was a great book to read, Google, you know, they, they don't want people in silos in their office. They, they have open office space. They have only, you know, two bathrooms. So everyone has to bump into each other in the hall. So that's where the communication occurs. So I can say, oh, Laura, I've been thinking, what about, and then there's a little nook that we can just pull off to the side and sit down and maybe a new idea blossoms, but that's not gonna happen on email. This all starts in the hiring process. There are three points, three areas I really wanted to touch on, hiring, leading, and managing. And the hiring process, I always felt it's easy to hire, hard to fire. Sure, Laura comes in, looks like a nice person, resumes looks good. Oh, by the way, whose resume doesn't really look good? She gets a couple of people to call me. If she's getting people to call me, they're probably going to say good things. So how can I really find out the skinny on Laura? Well, as an NBA scout, after I, I, I got, as a basketball coach, you get hired to get fired. So I've, I've been fired twice as a coach. And uh, I went to work in the NBA as a scout. And the big thing for us was intel. We wanted to find out who are we investing in? Because we're going to spend you know, millions of dollars on this player, and this player can make or break our organization. And it usually comes down to character. What kind of character? Is he a worker? Is he a good teammate? What's their care factor? Now this doesn't sound like a huge thing. Again, a soft skill, hard to measure. That's why you gotta do intel. Care factor hit me when I'm sitting behind the pacer bench, I was with my wife and family, the Pacers are playing the Hornets, and the Pacers are down like 25 points in the third period. Most of the players were making more money than the head coach. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what's their motivation to try to get back in this game and invest, invest the energy to win? What's their motivation? The care coach can only motivate so much. You can only motivate your staff so much. It's gotta be internal. So the team came back from a 25 point deficit and won the last minute of the game. That's a care factor. You know, what does that person do extra? Do they show up at, you know, let's say office hours are eight to five. Do they show up at eight? And I jokingly say, because I've had people in the office that look like track stars, they're in the blocks. 
with their backpack on at 4.59. They see the clock and they're gone. What kind of care factor is that? Do you finish your job? Do you do your job? Do you care? Do you care how you look? Do you care how you interact with people? Hard to measure, but critical. We talk a lot about culture. What is culture? That's a soft skill. That's, that's kind of fuzzy, but you know, you know it when you feel it, good and bad. Rick and I were talking on the ride here. I use Starbucks as an example. You walk into a Starbucks, you feel the culture. You feel the vibe, you feel, you see the ambiance, you know, the leather chairs, the, the, the wood, the, the colors, the smells, and they, they're gonna say hello, they're gonna put your name on a cup, they're gonna call you by name. If you don't have a good experience, they'll pour it out and give you a new cup. They care. Went to Dunkin' Donuts yesterday. Care factor's not so good. Okay, no offense to anybody that might be a franchisee owner of a Dunkin' Donuts, but there's a reason maybe their cup of coffee is $2.95 or $1.95 versus, you know, $2.95 or $3.95. The care factor is not there so much. We talked about Chick-fil-A. You feel it. And you can say, yeah, they, they meet people in the line out in the drive-thru. They greet you by saying hello to Chick, hello, um, hello to you know, welcome to Chick-fil-A. You know, they do those things, but they do it with feeling their body language and tone, okay? I can say to Laura, yeah, Laura, you did a good job. Or I can say, hey, Laura, man, what an awesome job you did. How, what, what inspired you to do that with that patient? Why did you go the extra mile? That was awesome. How can we incorporate that? You know, can you write that up and maybe we could try to implement that as a policy in the organization? Hey, tell Joe I said hello, okay, thanks. Oh man, huh? She's fired up. People don't go to work for the money. Like that may be a reason they take a job, but they don't stay at the job just because of money. They want to feel a part of a team. And if you're that right brain analytic type that is a grinder like me, you better move over towards the left brain a little bit. But that all starts in the hiring process. Lay down your role, their, their, their role and their expectations and be consistent. Coach Smith would always say, you start how you finish. If you're gonna be a certain way in day one, be that in day two, three, four, five. I'm Big, after I lost my job at North Carolina, I, again, I studied, I'd ask people, I love to ask questions. And if I'm around people that I feel like I can learn from, a friend of mine said, man, you, you sucked all the knowledge out of that guy. I said, yeah, I did. We, we, we were at uh, Kevin Huggins and I, buddy of mine, we went up to, uh, I wanna see the Yankees, I'm a Yankee fan, I wanna see the Yankees play at Fenway. So we got tickets, went up, and we were in a, uh, an establishment, let's call it, a bar. And uh, it's like one on every half block in, in Boston. And so uh, we bumped into a uh, baseball uh, coach, major league baseball coach. And so I'm starting to talk, all right, tell me about the signals. Like I wanna know about all the signals on third base and how you communicate because maybe we can do a better job as a basketball coach on the sidelines with communication, you know, and deceiving your opponent. And so we're talking about that for an hour or two. And Kevin says, man, you just, you just drained him of all his knowledge. Like, yeah, it was pretty interesting. I learned something. You know, I learned something. Um, I don't like a lot of idle chit chat. You know, how's the weather? How's, you know, like, what, what's your name? Where are you from? Oh, you grew up there? What's it like to grow up there? You know? And uh, I guess I got some of that from my, my parents because they never met a stranger. So as I reach into my pocket, I'll pull out a medallion. Anybody here serve in the service? Raise your hand. Okay, please stand up, please stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. 
a good friend of mine is Lieutenant Colonel Matt Karras uh, in the Army, and he gave me a medallion. And I love learning from the military because there's so many things that, I mean, what better organization is out there than the military, right? And so he gave me this medallion and it has their core values, it has their mission statement, it has symbols, and I never really understood the value of symbols and terms. And I just thought, I'm a grinder, right? There's the ball, go play. But some people need that to feel a part of a team. Coach Guthridge was the assistant coach while I played. And he had a secret handshake that only we knew. It made us feel special, like we were a, a part of a special club. I stole this idea from Matt Karras and I developed core values. And I put them on a coin and gave them to our players. I gave them wristbands. I put them up wherever they could see. However, I'm not one to want to see 20 sayings when I walk into a locker room. There's a reason why phone numbers are three and four digits long. Because before we had cell phones, we had to remember numbers. IV35733, that was my number growing up on Long Island. You can remember three things and four things, but if you get beyond four, you can't remember it. It's hard to remember. So I think your core values should be three or four items, values, and make it kind of a catchy acronym if you can. I have RTC, respect, trust, and commitment. Why did I come up with that? Because I felt that respect covers everything. That's a more important value than love. Because if you can't respect somebody, you won't love them. So to me, that's the most fundamental value that we can have. Why do you think we have road rage? Somebody cut off, cut you off, cut me off, they don't respect me. Cut me off online, don't respect me. I'm from New York. You cut me off, I'm gonna get you back. <laughs> Little side note, Tim Kite, K-I-G-H-T, is someone I follow on Twitter. And he came up with a great, great phrase or mathematical problem. E plus R equals O. E plus R equals O. I struggled with R because I am from New York and I'm competitive and I like to win. I like to be first. I like to be, you know, smarter than, it's not hard to be smarter than Rick, but maybe harder, hard to be smarter than Nancy. So she's really the challenge in the car rides. It's great to torture you. Now you don't get back up on the mic again, do you? Yeah. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> Take that back. Scratch that. So um, E stands for event. R stands for reaction, and O stands for the outcome. The only thing we control is the R. You can't control the event. Somebody cuts you off, somebody you know, spills something on you at a ball game, somebody says something to you at work, a customer shows up grumpy. So how you react leads to the outcome. I've, again, I'm going to use Chris as a, you talked about Chris yesterday about maybe a customer who was not pleased and Chris went the extra length and wasn't happy with his, his or her glasses, was in a bad mood maybe, or just one of those grumpy people, all right, comes in, complains about the glasses, wants a new set, it was the, the covering on it, right, the, the coating. And so what did Chris do? We'll take care of it. Delivered the glasses to their home himself with a pound cake, was it? Am I getting this right? <laughs> you bought a lot of pound cakes in your life? Yeah, Bob McKillop, my, co co my high school coach and the gentleman who's at Davidson, we talked about killing them with kindness. 
Kill them with kindness. You, you're not going to win them over, but you don't try to win. Your reaction is critical. The way you reacted diffused that. He went the extra mile, probably has that customer for life, for good or bad, <laughs> but they'll say good things. Because ultimately your best marketers are your customers. Your best marketers are your own people. And that starts with your core values. To me, respect, he respected that client even though maybe they didn't deserve it. But his R was terrific. So I talked to my family about E plus R equals O. So we were on a trip to Niagara Falls this um, summer. And uh, we're looking out over the falls and someone kind of gets in front of me. And again, I'm from New York and I'm like, and they're nudging and I'm nudging and I'm getting ready to take an elbow right to that person's ribs like I did when we played Duke. And uh, I back up, I back up. My daughter leans over. She's about six foot tall, so she gets in my ear. She goes, good R, Dad, good R. <laughs> so it can become a thing, you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to name or label some emotions or reactions. But when you give it a name, now you can, hey, Laura, great R. That person was a pain. Great R. Like, that was, Coach Smith would say, praise the actions you want repeated. I want Laura to do that again. Not only Laura, but tell me your name. Denise. Denise. What is Denise going to do if she's on my team and I praise Laura for having good R? Denise is going to have good R. What's your name? Adam. 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 Adam's going to have good R. And you know what? If he doesn't, he doesn't care. And you know what you do? You have your year-end evaluation, and you say, Adam, it's been nice working with you. You've got to remove your C players, and that goes to another book, Good to Great, with uh, uh, Jim Collins. Uh, great book. Respect. As a leader, do you respect your team? What does that look like? My wife is a dental hygienist, and she's worked with doctors. The appointment would be at 8.30. The doctor would show up at 8.30. No emotional intelligence. That doctor is not walking the floor, the shop floor, like the old-fashioned manufacturer. The leader needs to come down from his office and hit the floor and shake hands and say, hey, Laura, how you doing? Let's have a good day today. Hey, Denise, have a good day. Adam, you're out of here anyway. We got you replaced. <laughs> Let's have a good day. Now, that may not be your nature, but you can fake your way into a new way of acting. We've talked about that as coaches. Fake your way into a new way of acting. Fake it. Fake it until it becomes habit. And that's where leadership is a learned behavior. Rick, you said I had till 3 o'clock, right? Yeah, okay. Um, Without your staff feeling good, and again, a soft skill that us right brain analytical people don't really respect, us ENTJs don't really appreciate, but 92% of the population probably appreciates, so we need to get on board. Without your staff and clientele feeling good about being part of your team, your technical ability won't matter. You could be the best eye doctor in the world, but if your team isn't emotionally connected and supportive of you, your clients aren't going to be. And you know what? You're not going to make that much money. And maybe you go out of business. The, tr the, the core values trust is huge and that goes back to your behavior each and every day being consistent can they trust what they're going to see come through the door i've had bosses where when i walk into the 
building and I see a car not in their spot, I go like this. It's going to be a good day. I hope that's not the case in your office. I hope that they love seeing you come through the door. I hope when you come through the door, you come in early so you can greet your team and make them feel good about being on your team and about attacking the day and delivering the best customer service that you could possibly deliver. How do you hold each other accountable? I had bad R when I was a younger coach and somebody would do, make a mistake, show up late for practice, make a self, take a, a selfish shot, I would yell and get in their face. Now, body language. Laura, unfortunately for you, you're, you sit close. Come here. Laura's got heels on there at about six inches high. Yeah, still really short. So if Laura did something bad in practice or a game, I'd get square up and I'd get in her face and raise my voice. What's your normal reaction? Defensive. You're not going to listen to what I'm saying because body language is 50% of communication and 35% tone. So she's not listening to the 15% that's coming out of my mouth that you know, Laura, you should have cut down and hit the block and then come off the screen. She didn't hear that. She, she's hearing, oh, this guy's crazy. He's an asshole. I don't want to be here anymore. All right? As opposed to, go ahead, sit down. We had our team sign a stone, and it was the cornerstone of our organization, the foundation of our organization. And on it, it said RTC. SMU basketball and I had a ceremony once the team everyone made the team or let's say in your case you hired them they'd sign the stone and it would say respect trust and commitment so then I had a player who didn't go to class he was telling me he was going to class but he, he wasn't going to class so he didn't show me any respect because he was lying to me as a result I couldn't trust him and he was showing a lack of commitment to his academics and this program. Checks all three boxes. So I'd sit down with this young man and it was an unemotional event. I had awesome R that day. I mean, quality R. You guys should give me your hand. Right, right, right. I had good R, I had a good R that day. So I sat down, I said, Polis, I gave his name, but he lives in California now, so you won't come in contact with him. I said, Polis, I hear you're not going to class. And his eyes dropped. I said, you've been telling me you go to class. I said, Polis, did you sign that stone? He said, yes. I said, Polis, that's a contract. You signed that stone saying that you are going to be respectful, trustworthy, and committed. You broke all those values. And this was the, the kicker. This is what I'm most proud of. If you were me, what would you do? Dropped his head and he said, Coach, I'd suspend me. I said, okay, you're suspended. We walked out of the office arm in arm. So what do you think he said when he got to the locker room or he got to the break room? Man, Coach didn't yell. I'm suspended, but I, I suspended myself because I broke our core values. That is emotional intelligence. That is learned behavior. I wouldn't have done that years before as a younger coach. Going on to the mission statement, and, and I, I know we have, what, five minutes? Again, I think your mission statement should be one that if I came into the office and I said, Laura, what are our core values? RTC coach, or she might call you coach. Wouldn't be a bad thing to have you be called a coach, right? RTC, what does that stand for? Respect, trust, and commitment. Atta, atta girl. 
What's our mission statement? Well, I'm, again, this is just me. I don't like mission statements that are like a half page long. You've got to be able to uh, remember it, otherwise you can't live it. I would recommend something like improve the quality of life for our clients and our community. Simple, memorable, and effective. And it's got to be bigger than your organization. It's, and I think it's got to be involving the community. You've got to improve the community. What does that look like? <clears throat> Working at a you know, soup kitchen, donating clothes, donating eyewear, giving free exams for underprivileged youth, going out to the schools and having a clinic set up at a, at a, in a poor section of town and showing how important I where I care is. And you know what? That makes, you're giving back, but it's really the most selfish thing you can do. Because one, you feel good. Like we did something good today. And the other thing is, it's gonna drive business to your organization. Because they're gonna say, man, Dr. Laura came out with her team and spent a morning with us Examining our students and talking to them the importance of eye care, we're going to go to her. So that's really, ultimately, a, self, a selfish act. I talked about a, several other things that are in the notes, and, and I knew I wouldn't get to all of them. But I think, at the end, the, the management part is challenge. Because that's where it gets down to there's some dysfunction. There's going to be dysfunction in every team. How do you manage it? And if you avoid it, because you don't want to deal with it, and I've done that, it's going to grow and grow and grow until Rick had a good line, one of the first good lines he's had in a few years. He said, you can sweep it under the rug until it's so big you trip over it. Is that what you said? Yeah, I love that. I love those quotes. I, if you want, my Twitter handle is at Darty Matt. And I share that with you because I do a thought of the day every day. And it either pertains to, usually pertains to leadership or Proverbs. I think for those of you that are Christians, Proverbs is amazing because it, it delivers messages that were written so many years ago that are prevalent today. And things that bring down organizations. And I think the two biggest things that bring down organizations are jealousy and ego. And those are the things you got to manage. Jealousy and ego. And it's petty stuff. You know, as a, as a coach, as a leader, it's almost like five kids, 45 kids in the sandbox. It's my toy. Johnny came late, so I should come late. How come he came late? Why'd he get off early? How come? That stuff is real. And don't brush it under the carpet. And if you don't want to manage it, and this is where, again, I knew I was a grinder, but I knew we had, needed to add fun to the, to, to the practices. And I wanted to pr end practice on a high note. <clears throat> so I de delegated it. I delegated I called it Irvin time because we had a coach named Lance Irvin who had great energy, was fun to be around. And I said, Lance, the last 10 minutes of practice are yours. You do with them what you want. I just want those kids to have fun. So when they go off the court into the locker room, they're smiling. So I sat down, crossed my legs, folded my arms, and it was Irvin time. So if there's something you're not strong in, and this is where the self-awareness comes in, Delegate it. Maybe you have an office manager. You don't want to deal with some of those things because it drains your battery. You want to do, like as a coach, I wanted to coach, recruit, and raise money. I hated dealing with budgets. I hated dealing with, you know, making sure kids went to class. Now, I needed somebody to report that to me, but I didn't want to do that because it drained me. So what's your strength? What's your weakness? Hire a teammate to cover the weak areas, 
But that area, those little things, and I've said this many times as a coach, little things are big things. You take care of the little things and the big things will take care of themselves. But if you have some infighting or jealousies or egos, that's going to permeate up and ultimately to your clients and they're going to feel it and they may not want to come back. Lastly, call to, to action. You ultimately serve your clients, but you also serve your staff. If you don't serve your staff first, your clients won't get the service they deserve. And then lastly, and I read this quote and I put it on Twitter, it's by Marshall Goldsmith, who is uh, kind of one of the leaders in, in management, um, a professor, I think studied at Indiana, where's, there you are. Congratulations to Purdue last night, by the way. Yeah, go, go, go Gobblers, go Virginia Tech tonight, by the way. Um, he wrote, as we advance in our careers, behavioral changes are often the only significant changes we can make. You all are going to get the best technology, the best literature. So why is your practice going to be better than the practice across the street? It's because how you and your team behaves. I really appreciate the opportunity. I don't coach anymore. So for me to get up and feel like I'm coaching and teaching is fulfilling to me. I hope that you got something out of this. If you have any questions, um, Rick knows how to find me. I, I don't think I put my email address on here. Um, any questions before we break? Yes, Chris. Did Polis go back to class? <laughs> Great question. Did Polis go back to class? I think so. He graduated. Yes, good question. Any, any other questions or any other struggles you're having? Okay, I'll be around and uh, yes. Well, I think one webinars, you know, where you see the body language, um, that, that is, I think, critical because we all know on conference calls, what do people do on conference calls? They mute their line and they don't listen, right? I mean, you ever say, hey, Laura, what do you think about that? Laura, Laura? Oh, hey, hey, Matt, yeah, oh, hey, I agree. 100%. You're not going to sit up front next time. <laughs> so I think webinars. And then the good old-fashioned drive to your customer. Have these type of meetings. And I know sometimes you, you don't dread coming to the wild dunes. But, you know, you're saying, well, if I'm not in my office, I'm not generating revenue. But sometimes you have to take one step back to take two steps forward. Because hopefully, when you leave here, you're going to be energized and better. Hopefully, you get better today. And then your practice and your team will benefit from it. But the old good old-fashioned get in a car or buy a plane ticket and meet with someone or meet with a group, there's no substitute for that because you know what happens? There are people right now that are not comfortable asking questions. So... If you're feeding us lunch, right, Rick? Yeah. Dang. <laughs> wow. That was in my contract. <laughs> um, but socially, you know, we'll be hanging out. And then maybe someone who didn't feel like answering a question or something pops in their head saying, hey, Matt, I have this issue. How would you handle it? So just by being around each other socially, things come up. And then, you know, there's no better way for someone in here to mentor someone else. And you have, you have Rick and you have your team, but I would imagine that somebody would welcome a call and it'll be a compliment to say, hey, you've been at this a lot longer than I have. I have this situation, how would you handle it? That exchange is powerful. Again, I appreciate it, a lot of fun. Thank you and I wish you the best of luck.